Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast. It's fantastic to have you with me again here today. And we're up on episode number 24, and we're talking all about the Alexander Technique today. And I know you're going to find this fantastically helpful for you, uh, whether it's either for you personally in your presenting and your teaching, um, or whether it's something that you can use with your students. Um, I know when I first heard about the Alexander Technique uh, and saw it in action at a conference, I learned a heap from it. And I know that uh, Greg today, our guest, uh, will give you lots of great ideas and um, tips and things about how you can use this in your studio. Now, as usual, we'll have show notes for this episode at timtopham.com forward slash episode 24. And if you've got a spare couple of minutes and you're enjoying these episodes, I'd love for you to head over to iTunes to review the podcast. You can find out how to do that at timtopham.com forward slash iTunes and all the instructions are there. So my guest today is Greg Holdaway. He's Director of Training and the owner of Sydney Alexander Technique. He's been training, teaching and investigating human movement and potential for over 30 years, including 10 years in dance and 20 as an Alexander Technique specialist. More recently, he spent time in academic study and teaching in the areas of anatomy and physiology, biomechanics and motor control. His particular academic interests have focused around the control of movement via reflexes and the use of motor imagery for influencing motor control. Now, I know Greg will go into depth on some of those topics, so if you didn't understand too much of that, um, um, I'm, my, my hand's up, I'm with you there. Um, I'm sure there's lots for us to learn from Greg. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for uh, being a part of it. Thanks, Tim. Fantastic to be here. So look, let's get straight into it. And can you tell us what is the Alexander Technique all about and how is it of relevance for piano teachers in particular? Well, the Alexander Technique is a a way in which you can improve the coordination, the balance, the rhythm, the timing, the sequencing of anything that you care about. (laughs) Okay. Everything that we do is in some way related to the way in which we coordinate and move. Everything that we think and feel is in some way related to the way in which we're coordinating and moving. And yet often we don't actually attend as much or as well as we could do to the coordination of the whole person. So the Alexander Technique is about helping people to figure that out uh, in terms of making practical improvements in the way you do things. So in a practical sense, um, let's say uh, I've got, um, oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pianist perhaps uh, and I'm regularly sitting for, geez, I wish this was true, like four hours, maybe six hours a day at the piano practicing because I've got a concert coming up. Um, is, are there features of the Alexander Technique which would help me um, sort of get the most out of playing or is it more about um, avoiding injuring myself or well, both? Yeah, well, both because, you know, if you think about it, the things that you do that make you a wonderful player, the fluidity and your control over the instrument and your you know, organization of the music are all the same sorts of things that are associated with being very healthy and functioning very well in the way that you're sitting, in the way that you're moving, in the way that you're breathing, making sure that the joints are free so that you're cooperating with your whole structure. So really, while generally we do work with people with a focus on rehabilitation a focus on prevention in terms of functioning well, everything that we do feeds into great performance. And that's the way that lessons often progress or that the work often progresses. A person comes in, they're struggling with something, we help them to sort that out. And as they're sorting it out, they discover that they're playing better, that they're making better sound, that their music teacher or their you know rehearsal director is liking it a lot. And so it becomes really oriented around performance. And that's, that's what we like to do. Mm, that's a great outcome, obviously. So can you give us just a little bit of background into uh, who this Mr. Alexander was? I, I was reading and I heard he, he was actually um, a Shakespearean actor of some sort. And that's how he actually got into it. Yeah, Alexander was a professional voice user. He was a uh, reciter. And then he used to recite uh, Shakespearean soliloquies and things. He was uh, Tasmanian. All right, okay. Oh, yeah. there you go. I didn't know he was Australian. Yeah, Alexander's an Australian. There's a there's a plaque to him down in Table Cape in Tasmania. Which <laughs> there you go. A few times. So, um, and he had a one of those one of those sort of classic problems that people often have a problem which is recurring in nature, which is uh, uh, a little bit difficult to figure out exactly what's going on. Every time he used his voice professionally, he'd he'd get uh, throat discomfort. He'd lose his voice, and he tried all kinds of things, as you would, you know, voice teachers and, uh, you know, medical approaches and, and various things to try and sort this thing out. 
with a very limited amount of success. So a kind of recurring, niggling problem which progressively got worse over time until it got to the place where it was actually seriously impeding his performance and it was going to mean that he was going to have to give up his career and he loved that career and he really wanted to do it. And so he was like, well, you know, I've got to, I've got to sort this out. I've got to work out what's going on. Uh, he made a very, um, very simple observation, which was that when he used his voice professionally, he had this kind of problem. When he rested his voice, which was recommended by the doctors, the, it would come fine and the, the problem would go away and he'd be able to use his voice fine. But then as soon as he'd go back to use his voice professionally again, the problem would start to recur. And this kind of happened a few times until it came to a critical moment when there was a particularly important performance. He rested his voice for a couple of weeks beforehand. He was in great shape. He got up on stage. It was all flowing. It was all happening. And as he went through the performance, it progressively got worse. And by the end of the performance, he could hardly speak. He was croaking and gasping and, and it was a disaster and it was an awful experience, right? So he went back to the doctor, back to the doctors, and he said, well, I've, I've got to be doing something to myself when I'm performing that I don't normally do because when I just, you know, rest and whatever, it comes fine. But as soon as I do this activity, it gets worse. I'm doing something to myself. What am I doing? Mm-hmm. And the doctor goes, well, that's, you know, that's completely logical. That makes complete sense. And I've got no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what you're doing, but you're doing something. And so he went away to find out for himself. That was the, the journey that Alexander entered into was trying to figure out his own thing, you know. And, do you, know, and do you know what that was for him in that case? Yeah. So he, he made some observations straight away. And it turns out that these observations are very... Uh, almost universal in some way. In fact, in some ways they are universal to the way that the human being coordinates and functions and balances and so on. And I'm saying that because I know that you're particularly interested in piano playing and I've worked a great deal with pianists over the years. I work a lot with musicians, I've done a lot of work with musicians, and I see similar things to what Alexander saw in himself with the pianists on a regular basis. So just kind of to make that point. What he discovered to very to straight off was that every time he went to use his voice in a professional way, he was somehow pulling his head a little bit back on his neck. Mm. And when he pulled his head a little bit back on his neck, it made him a little stiff. And that little bit of stiffness was somehow affecting the movement of the vocal mechanism, which meant that he had to gasp for air. He couldn't get enough air into his lungs and was creating all this, this pressure. And if he did that for a little while, it would start to get uncomfortable. And if he did it for a long time, it got very uncomfortable and, you know, progressively had that happen. Yeah. So it was a very simple observation to begin with. He, he noticed that he was doing this little pulling in, the, in himself. And um, would that it have been just that simple? In the end, it is that simple. But if you've ever attempted to change a pattern of movement or a coordination that you have that you know is a habit, something you've done forever, mm particularly something in a professional sense that you've actually trained in because every single time you went to perform or rehearse or practice, you did this little thing, you know, how the, how the, how the oboe lifts up the oboe and how the pianist lifts up their hands onto the piano, you know, these things that you do billions of times we're never really thinking about it. If one of those actions contains within it something which is harmful to your coordination or to your performance, they can be very challenging to change. And there's two real essential reasons for that, I suppose. One is because as soon as you train something in, it becomes invisible. <laughs> That's true. Like, yeah. The next training is that you train so that you don't have to think about what you're doing, so that so much of what you're doing has become automatic. But unfortunately, if you've trained something in which is harmful like that, well, then you know you're doing something, but you no longer know what it is because it's not sort of accessible to consciousness anymore. Yes. So a big part of Alexander Technique is actually part of what happens is that we have help people to see what they're doing that they didn't know that they were doing, which is influencing performance and action. So mm. part of what we do. And I've seen that in action too when uh, when you or other people have worked or, you know, on YouTube, that sort of thing. That's right. That's I, right. That's and I think right. you said there was two parts. Was that was there one other? Uh, there is another part. That's because that habit that you develop, the thing which you're doing, which you don't necessarily know you're doing, and, and the sort of characteristic pattern, as I said, is a, is a tendency to over-stiffen. Mm are other patterns other than over stiffening, but that's the most classic things they do. Piano players, you know, it's all in the lower back and the pelvis. I've worked with hundreds of them and they're all the, they're not all the same, but you know, there's a lot of that. So anyway, 
then when you ask yourself to do something different, you come to try and change something like that, you want to move in a freer way, you want to all reorganize your movement so that you can use your hands more easily, whatever it is, you find that any attempt to create a change somehow cannot feel right to you. Right. That as soon as you try to change something that's in your professional technique or in the way that you're coordinating, it doesn't gel and it doesn't feel right and it don't feel like you can actually play if you sit like that and it just doesn't it's just it's just all wrong right? mm -hmm. and that sensation that that uh, what we call a, a, a conditioned reflex or conditioned proprioception the, the sense of where i am in space and how i'm how i'm moving is a strong barrier to improvement in performance and coordination for rehabilitation of performance because the person doesn't you can't get to something that's genuinely new when you don't genuinely know what the new thing is going to feel like. Sure. So you, you keep ending up somehow reverting to the sorts of patterns that you've used in the past because that's what you're, that's what feels right to you to do. You know, it's mm. right to sit like this, it's right to use my arms like that, whatever. The constant theme in doing Alexander lessons is you help a person to figure out the coordination of themselves to think differently about their action. And as that starts to happen, they start going, this is really like weird. Yeah, yeah. It's like weird, like like it's like freer, and and then the sound sounds better, but but somehow it doesn't feel right. I don't know, you know, sometimes people really like that sensation. Sometimes people are very disturbed by that sense of that experience. But in order to train a real difference, you need to be prepared to enter into the experience of the unknown in relation to the way things feel. And for a professional, that can be quite scary. You know, it's a it, you know you're dependent upon what you do in order to perform and so on and. And there's this whole recalibration of how you how you move. Mm. Interestingly <laughs> enough, uh, sorry, I was gonna, I was going to say I uh, I'm a cyclist and a runner, and right. uh, I've recently uh, I had a lot of issues um, with shin splints, uh, which is a you know pain in the shins when running, um, and so I stopped doing it for many years. And I've recently found a physio who's actually really approached it from my a whole body perspective. And they've uh, been giving me a lot of exercises for my hip kind of area and the hip flexors and that. And also just giving me some cues to think about when I'm running to make sure my style is right. And I have to say, it, to change your running style, I'm 39, like to change it after that many years of running is incredibly difficult. So uh, I wonder if um, when you have uh, people come to you and work with you, do they, is it quite incremental often over a long period of time that they can change actually? I'm sure they can change things in a lesson, but to actually make it natural must take some time for some people because it certainly is for me in my running. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, actually, I'm, I'm quite familiar with shin splints. I was a professional dancer originally, and I've, I've done a lot of that kind of work with people as well. Yeah. Activities like that. Maybe that's a conversation offline some point. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, I was also going to say, it sounds like a lot is, of this is to do with tension. Tension, uh, and I bring that up because uh, I'm familiar with the Taubman technique, for example. Um, and I was interested to find out how Dal Crows and Taubman and other movement based uh, approaches uh, link together, or are they quite different? Uh, it's a good question. I think that the Alexander technique is essentially an enabler, it's a, it's a process that enables you to get the most out of whatever it is that you know, whatever it is that you wish to do. And that includes things like specific uh, piano techniques and methodologies and, and movement processes like the So I've had a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a taste of those kinds of processes with people that I've worked with. I think that in that Alexander technique as an enabler is in some ways uh, very different from what you experience in other kinds of training. It is unique in a lot of regards. And yet at the same time, there is a great deal of overlap. We're all working with human function. We're all working with the particular skill that we're interested in. And human beings are human beings. There's, there's massive uniqueness and difference between people, but at the same time, we all have similar principles around the way that we function. So, so there's a reasonable amount of overlap. The, the direction that we come at is uh, explicitly about the unity of function of the whole person in the action. So one of the things you'd say is that when you do an action with your hand on the piano, it's not really an action of your hand. It's an action of your whole self, which includes the action and the activity of the hand. So to learn to, to include the idea of your whole self in the specific activity that you're doing 
is a little unusual. It's not something that, that most people are used to thinking about. But when you do that, when you when you consciously incorporate the idea of your whole self in the action, your coordination substantially improves. And the reason for that is because it is a coordination of your whole self that drives the movement of the hand. Mm. It is something that's going on in your mind that generates the tension and the movement. So people sometimes come and they say, well, you know, I've got this problem with my little finger and I've got this tension in my hand or my arm. And the simple response to that is that it's generally, not always, but generally that's not about the hand or the arm or the finger. It's about the signal that's going to the hand or the arm or the finger, which is coming through the nervous system and is amenable and accessible to consciousness. So a great deal of what we do is automatic and unconscious in the way that we coordinate. The Alexander Technique teaches people how to enter into the realm of thinking clearly about what they're doing in relation to things that are normally automatic. Right, okay, yeah. So you, you learn to include the sense or the idea of your whole self in the action and then to build upon that the, the particular action plan that you're after for the quality of the sound or the, the, spe, you know, the specific movements that you're after. Um, piano is in, you know, infinitely fascinating in relation to how people produce such amazingly varied sounds with a structure which is essentially the same. I mean, the pianos are all made essentially the same, right? Mm -hmm. Very interested in that relation between the speed of the center of the key and the throwing of the hammer onto the onto the uh, strings and, and how the foot modulation of that occurs. I've been talking to some great specialists in that very recently uh, in the, in the uh, latest ASPA conference, actually. That's uh, the Australian Society of Performance Art Health, So I was presenting out in Brisbane recently. So... I'm gathering more and more information about how these mechanisms work. From an Alexander perspective, it circulates around the overall or general coordination of the whole self, the whole person. And we were kind of lucky because Alexander uh, stumbled on something in his investigations, which has an effect of coordinating, or bringing into coordination the mind and the body in relation to the whole of the person at once, a very simple idea. And that has something to do with the relation between the head and the spine. So we could go into some technical details about what that's about if, you, if we have the time, if we're interested. There, are, there is a lot of information about that. But essentially we'd say that any kind of uncertainty, confusion, anxiety, multiple thoughts at the same time, trying to do multiple things simultaneously. I want to do this. I don't want to do that. My teacher is saying this. I feel that. All happening simultaneously in the consciousness. They're all reflected in what happens in the musculature of the body directly. In other words, your, your physicality is responding to what you're projecting, what you're thinking all the time. It does what you ask. Mm -hmm. And people often have the impression that it doesn't. You go, well, my hand won't do this. I said, well, actually, it's not that your hand doesn't do this. It's that you're not clear about what this message to send to your hand so that it can do that. Right. You see what I mean? Yeah. That's the way we function. Your, your body is, this, is in service of the mind, especially in something like production of music and everything, really. So this uh, delicate relation or balance between the head and the spine is central to the coordination of the whole system. And that has to do technically with what we call the writing reflexes, the muscular support, the tone, the muscular tone, which supports the doing of actions. When you want to do an action with freedom and fluidity and coordination and ease, that needs support. And the support comes from background muscle tone. The background muscle tone is generated indirectly through the nervous system via reflex mechanisms. The Alexander Technique is a method by which you can tap into that mechanism. Right. So, yeah. I'll so, have to keep talking for as long as you like. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Well, look, I, I'm, I'm thinking it would be cool to... Uh, to hear some of these things in, in action for, for people listening. So, uh, you know, people might be sitting in their car or they might be at a piano or just at their desk. Have you got some tips now that they can use to set themselves up? I know it's probably hard. Obviously, you're not, you can't physically manipulate people. But are, are there some general things you could say to piano teachers? Obviously, sitting down and sitting properly is a core kind of competency for a pianist, which other instruments don't have. So have you got some tips about how to do it themselves? Because we, we often spend a lot of the day sitting down and how we can um, help our students sit better. Because I know for a fact, I'm pretty sure anyway, uh, sit up straight isn't something that's very useful for 
piano teachers to say to our students, but we all say it. So <laughs> give us give us some help. Talk us through some ideas uh, as we sit here now even. All right. So the, the, uh, uh, the essential thing is to uh, get rid of unnecessary stiffness. So if the person is attempting to sit up straight directly, they'll tighten the muscles in the back. Tightening the muscles in the back pulls the shoulders and the arms backwards which is the opposite direction that they need to move in in order to be able to do something with your hands on the keyboard. Okay. So the first thing you do is if you ask somebody to sit up straight, you're going to be interfering with the function of their arms because you're making the arms go backwards at a time when you actually want them to go forwards. So that's a right. very straightforward. Okay. Big no-no, number one. We've learned it. All right. <laughs> what should we say instead? Because we have those kids that come in and they're like this. Well, I do anyway. <laughs> you do. do. You do. So um, there's kind of, we can say that there's, a, there's an emotional psychological idea when a child is engaged and interested in what they're doing, they generally function and move better. Okay. When they're totally bored and disengaged and they're doing something they don't really want to do, then you'll see all these kinds of weird stuff going on in their body. That's not such a great insight, right? All you've got to do is look at a few kids in school classrooms to see that. That's true, yeah. In fact, the people that I'm thinking, some of the worst postured people I'm thinking of, you, you've hit the nail on the head already. Right, yeah. right, right. So straight away, you see this, this relation between the mind, the emotion, and the movement. Yeah. So in some way, you're looking to create an engaging environment, which is engaging enough for the person to forget that they're actually doing something that involves work, because they're so interested in doing it that, that it just kind of happens and then their body will move better, okay? Yeah. That's a broad statement. It's a very important statement, because you cannot force somebody into good coordination. Good coordination, by definition, is the congruence of mind and body, where the person is actually has a clear idea about what they want to do so that they can do it. Sure. So Brings about good coordination. You see, you see that. Mm -hmm. So then, in, in a movement sense, you take the person into their they're in their slump or or whatever. And there's a number of ways of doing this, but you just let them be relaxed. You don't try and make them sit up straight. Okay. You help them to identify where their sitting bones are, their rockers underneath the pelvis. Mm -hmm. So it's sitting on the seat. Now you can wiggle your bum around on the chair a little bit. Yep. And there's two bones underneath there. Mm -hmm. shape like curves if you rock forward on the pelvis yep you feel the sources the support comes a little narrower so you think um, bicycle seat bicycle seat wide at the back narrow at the front sure yep designed that way so that you can rock forward on the bicycle seat and still have the freedom for the movement of the legs mm -hmm. because you balance on the base of the pelvis the base of the pelvis are the sitting bones underneath rocking backward they get a little wider rocking forward they get a little narrower you don't sit on your legs, you sit on your sitting bones. Okay. I, I'm just picturing people uh, around the world listening to this now and just rocking backwards and forwards. It's going to look a bit weird, but that's great. That's <laughs> so you know, your kid is kind of a, a little bit relaxed in the chair and you're going, and here's your bottom bones underneath and you can use all sorts of fun ways of, of showing that to, to kids, obviously. And then you get them to rock, they're just able to rock backwards and forwards. So the first thing for a... a beginning to build an effective postural movement balance for piano playing is freedom of movement at the pelvis. Okay. It's the support that comes up from the seat underneath, which is enabled because the whole system is free to move. If there's a stiffness or a holding, like, you know, sitting up straight holding in my back, yeah. the, the transference of forces and movements is interrupted by that. It can't self-balance. Okay. So we're looking to create the conditions under which the body can self-balance which is when it's easy and free to do, right? Yep. The next thing, um, again, depending on the age of the kids and the situation they're in, we're talking very generally here, obviously, is you remind them that they have a head. <laughs> so how, many, okay. how, many, how many people do you know that think you go, okay, well, I've got a head, here's my head, right? <laughs> but you know that, but you never think about it, right? No, you don't. It's never part of the idea of the way in which you coordinate yourself or do actions because you know you're doing stuff with your hands or you know you've got pressure in your back or you know you're doing something with your breathing, whatever. But generally, this isn't something which is consciously included in the idea of the movement of the person. I would agree. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's interesting. I've worked a lot with yoga people, very sophisticated yoga people, incredible knowledge about oh, how it all works, all that, and most of them haven't got a head. <laughs> <laughs> They've never thought about it. They don't think about it. Okay. That's right. So your head balances over the top of your spine at about earlobe level. Right. The little soft spot. You're going to have hard, but you've got... Yeah, no, I can't. Got my head there's a little on. soft spot just behind the earlobes. There's a bone back there and there's a little soft spot. Yeah, just in behind the earlobe. And yep. you feel the bone bone, there's a little soft spot in there. 
Mm -hmm. And that's kind of up through the middle of the neck. The spine comes up through the middle of the neck, underneath the skull, and approximately the level of in there, in the middle, obviously, yeah. is where the skull sits on top of the spine. So the first movement of the head on top of the spine is this little nodding of the head right up on the top of the spine. Mm -hmm. Kind of what you'll see with your kids who are collapsing and other people, whatever, is that they tend they block their their head together with their neck, mm -hmm. and everything kind of drops. And it like goes that. forward like that, yeah. Right. So you go well. Actually, you know your skull balances over the top of your spine, and there's all sorts of imaginative ways in which you can play with that idea, just so that the person has got a sense of the skull moving. Okay. Right. Now, sometimes talking like that to somebody makes them a little stiff. They go, oh, God, there's my head. I've got to do something with the head. <laughs> so we do this funny thing. We go, we go, take a look at a hand. Notice where your hand is. Mm. So it's your left hand or your right hand. Notice your right hand, whatever. You know where it is? Yep. Got it. How do you know where it is? Because I can see it. Right. What about if you put it somewhere where you couldn't see it? I guess I can. Do that, yeah. Yeah. You still know I... Where it is? Yeah, I know where it is. Yeah, well, how do you know that? Because uh, it's connected to my arm, I guess. Something, something mysterious. What about your left foot? If you notice your left foot, well, you can bring your arm out now. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 where is it? Do you know where your left foot is? Yeah, I guess I do. I guess you do. Do you have to do anything to know where it is or do you just kind of go, oh, where is it? And there it is. No, I don't have to do anything to know where it is. Anything, but you are thinking about it, right? I have to think about it though, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So this is uh, what we call a spatial sense or more technically it's related to the idea of proprioception and um, muscle, muscle movement sense, the spatial sense. Spatial sense is a different thing from a, the feeling of muscles working. Knowing where you are is a different thing from doing something with the part. Okay. Where it is. It's so obvious when you think about it that when you put your hand on the keyboard, you need to know where the keyboard is. Mm -hmm. What's not so obvious is that you also need to know where your hand is. Okay. And we have this automatic mechanism that tells us where we are in space. And it's so obvious that people don't know they have it. I, I guess that's what allows you to do it with your eyes shut too. Right. Yeah. Right. Proprioception, knowing where you are in space. Yeah. So when we say your head moves over the top of your spine, yeah. up here, we're talking spatial sense. You don't have to do anything to know where your head is. Mm -hmm. All you're going to do is remember it, think that it's there just like you did with your foot or your hand. Okay. So here's my hand, it's up above my neck specifically above the sort of cheekbone level up here is the skull. All right? All right. So now we go to our little story with the kids. So you go, they've got their little slump, right? And you've taught them to, they can rock forwards and backwards easily on the bottom. Yeah. And you go, here's your head up the top up here. And all I want you to do is just remember that your head is up on the top up there while you look at the music or you look at the keyboard while you rock forwards on the chair or rock backwards a little bit like that. Just okay. that. So can, awareness of, of the head. Yep. Okay. Whilst, while rocking freely on the sitting bones. So okay. those, those are the two instructions. And that's it. Almost, well, it depends again. I mean, I'm talking in very general terms and teaching is always specific to the students. So we sure. acknowledge that, right? But as a consequence of that, you stimulate what we call a writing reflexes. Right, writing, writing, did you say? Writing. Yeah, writing reflexes. That is the reflexes that bring you up in relation to gravity. Right. Uh, writing technically would mean... Oh, like you, write a ship. That yeah, kind I think of, it's okay, just, I'm with you. Yeah. Actually to be in balance. Yeah. We have this mechanism within us that does that. It brings us up naturally into balance. When the conditions are right, the body will naturally balance. Right. So we're I, looking I really I really like this this idea. So it's 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 awareness, it's bringing awareness to the movement right. and where you are in space to right. allow the student to realize their own organization right. sort of thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Now, one of the funny things about this, of course, is as you do that, there, there, are, there are a couple of things to, to be aware of. One is that it'll probably still feel like they're slumping, even though they're not. Okay. Because the, the sense of slump is the relaxation in the back muscles. And when you're sitting beautifully well, your back muscles have appropriate tone, mm -hmm. not over tight. Right. Because most pianists are used to having over tight mu muscles in their back, as soon as you start to help to balance in this more natural way, it feels like you're not doing enough. It feels like, oh, but, but I'm all relaxed. I shouldn't be sitting all relaxed. That's not right. And you go, but isn't that what you wanted to sit all relaxed? They go, yeah, but aren't I slumping? And you show them in the mirror and they go, but I'm not slumping, but I feel like I am. That's really weird. And how good is that though, isn't it? It's, that's, 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 yeah, that's the ultimate. Kind of, 
Yeah, so, I've got. Um, I've got. Sorry to interrupt you. I've got a, a student who will sit quite well when um, playing, right. but if I start talking, we'll do the old <laughs> like this. So it's they almost bob up and down every time. Um, and so I, you know, I say, well, now you know, how does this feel to be in this position when they're when they're about to play? And are you able to hold that, you know, just comfortably while while I talk to you as well? And they can for a while, and then they start to do this a bit more. Have you ever experienced that, or is that a bit of an anomaly with one of my students? Yeah, totally. well, that, well, it's a natural human behaviour, isn't it? You know, the person has a pattern of movement which is engaged for playing the piano, and then they stop playing the piano, so that pattern of movement disappears. Right. And the sitting is a part of that. Right. So we want to teach people how to be well balanced contextually appropriately. Okay. Yeah. If you're stuck in a slump, you know, I have to say, you know, I've worked a lot with, I often work with musicians who have had difficulty because that's the nature of the work. People come because they've had trouble. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with some young musicians recently, young people recently, who've been in terrible, terrible trouble because they've been forced to try and do what they really didn't want to do in a way which didn't match the anatomy very well. And so they get more and more uncomfortable and because they're so keen, you know, they really want to do well. So they push hard against the discomfort and it gets more and more painful. And it just, you end up creating this, this wall, you know, this concrete wall. I can't. And then, you know, they either give up in desperation, they break down one way or another, or they come to they us. come and see you. <laughs> we have to sort it out, right? So it's this, yeah, the how to. Mm. And it ha has absolutely to do with the engagement of the mind. Yeah. Relaxation and slumping is a natural behavior. If you ask people what's more comfortable, you know, sitting in front of the piano to do this with my back all straight or sitting like this where it's kind of like a little bit of a slump, which, you know, I wouldn't do it in front of my piano teacher because they wouldn't let me do whatever, you know, nine times out of ten, not every time, but nine times out of ten, you're going to get this is more comfortable. Yes. So you want to be comfortable and free to move and engaged in movement when you play the piano. So, unfortunately, so many people get taught to do something which is inherently uncomfortable, hard to do, and makes you stiff in order to try and play the piano. Mm. They have trouble playing the piano and they don't enjoy it so much and maybe they don't go on and, and reach their potential, you know, as a result of that. So, it's actually quite a big deal. Yeah, you... absolutely. Well, I think, I think this is a really important part of what we've discussed today, to be honest. I mean, if we can help our students just get their approach to the piano right from the beginning, that's going to make a huge difference. And I'm not, right. I'm not saying, obviously, <laughs> you've obviously got far more um, experience in this. But, you know, j just, I guess, for teachers to explore that with their students, th this, yep. the rocking motion, the, the relationship of their head and the body and the spine. Giving permission for the slump, the rocking motion, relation between the head and the, and the pelvis, move forwards and backwards. Mm. The other thing I was going to say is it might feel like the person is still in a slump even though they're sitting pretty well. It might look to the teacher like it's not the right thing. Because teachers often have this idea that, erroneous, unfortunately, as it, as it often is, that somehow or other, this is good posture. I don't know if you can see that very clearly in the video, but here I am, right? But shoulders, shoulders back, back. Get sticking up, tying in my back, you know, all, all of this. That is actually harmful to good function. People do well in spite of that, not because of it. Right. It's great to know. Yeah. So we say you've got to figure out what it, what it does look like when a person sits and balances well kind of natural. Mm. A couple of things you might say about that is that the people balance over the front of the spine. Where's the front of your spine, Tim? Uh, probably near, so, my, near my back somewhere. It's the you're, back of your spine. You're, you're, you're going to tell me it's right in the middle of my body or something, aren't you? I am because that's where it is. <laughs> <laughs> the front of your spine is in the middle of your body, especially in your lumbar, low body, and we won't get too technical, but so yeah, there are down near your, the back side of your stomach kind of, well, you know, a bit lower than that. That's the lumbar, isn't it? Yeah, the lumbar. So in the lower so body. Yeah. Yeah, in your lower back. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So down there, the spine, the supporting structure that actually, you know, you've got vertebrae with discs in between and that's flexible, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that moves. That supporting structure, which essentially provides the upward support against gravity, is deep inside the body. It's in the middle. Not in your back. You do not balance over your back. 
there's nothing in your back which supports weight. If you look at the structure of the skeleton, they, they're little things that stick out in the back like that. There are gaps in between them. Right. They don't support any weight. Because the, the weight, bit, yeah. It's the bit that's in the middle. Yep. Right. So when you look at somebody balancing and sitting, you'll see an organization which is organized up and over or up and forward as opposed to up and back, which is what you so often see with a pianist. Right. With a pianist, uh, up and back. Because it's trained like that with the, with the teachers and whatever, you know, sit up straight thing. Yeah. See, when a person is balanced really beautifully, the whole torso is coming up and over the front of the spine, and there's this kind of softness and flexibility to it, lack of effort, and yet it's balanced. So, you know, you can move it, you can just move around in whatever whatever direction, whatever you wish to do, you see. Yeah. So it's a different kind of look. You yeah, see. yeah. And it, will be, it could be slightly different for everyone. That's the other thing that you're saying, too. So you might look at a student and go, no, oh, it doesn't look right, but actually, that is their comfortable, natural, balanced position? Could be, yes. Okay. And then, you know, because we're talking in very general terms and we acknowledge that there's a lot of individual differences between people and as a teacher, you're really interested in getting good information about how you function mm. and how your students function because then you can actually make these kinds of judgments more easily with your students and, and really help them, you know, mm. get good information about it. That's, so I've got to ask you some other questions just about because I know piano teachers, we're all always discussing position of hands and wrists and all that kind of stuff. Uh, when I get a student to set themselves up at the piano, okay. I, I, will, I will aim for uh, their arms, their forearms to be more or less horizontal with the ground right. when their arms are hanging next to their body and that on the keyboard to, to get their seat height. Am I on the right track there? I think that is, again, there are general principles which are useful. The human being is so adaptable and so flexible that you can be a great performer doing just about anything. Yes, obviously, Some, Greg, Glenn Gould aside. <laughs> like, and like sitting yeah. really low. Yeah. So you, so you see the point. Yeah. Don't want to be too over strict about what is right and what is wrong because it absolutely is the case that people's nervous systems are able to, to adapt and function very well in a, in a multiple of different ways. Having said that as a sort of preliminary statement, there are general principles related to human structure and function, which mean that some things are easier to do than others, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's easier to have the body balanced in a way in which you're coming up and forward. So as, a, as, a, as a, another sort of quick comment about that, sometimes we put people on a little, on a little slope on the seat, like a foam wedge or something. Right. So as it brings the pelvis a little more up and forwards and the person is then oriented over the keyboard or just that little bit more makes it so much easier to balance and move right. because they're just falling back in the back thing happening all the time, right? So there's just a, it's an ergonomic kind of an idea. Yeah. The height is the same sort of thing. So, you know, Glenn Gould and, the, and theirs play beautifully, right? Yep. They're not everybody is Glenn Gould, right? They're not all going to be able to do that. That's right. So ergonomically, it does make sense for the arm to be organized so that the hand can, can essentially come forward and down onto the key. Okay. So you're, up, you're high enough so that you have that, uh, exactly as you said, either level or slightly descending. Slightly down, yeah. Just, just like that, so that you've got the ease of movement through the wrist onto the fingers, right? Yeah. There's going to be a lot of movement. Mm. And we have a tendency to think about these things in maybe in a little bit of the static terms, postural terms. It's about balance and movement more so than it is about position. Okay. Freedom of movement, coordination of the key ideas here, much more so than postural position, which tend to make the person somewhat fixed. And the fixture that it means you can't move really in order to do the thing you want to do. <laughs> sure. Have you got any other just more general tips of things that you see pianists do quite regularly and you're just like, oh, I, if only they'd known 10 years ago to just try this instead or, yeah. or not worry about this or something? Oh, well, totally. Could you narrow, narrow it down to a, to a couple? Yes, I can narrow down to a couple. I just want to, you know, there are actually a lot of things. So sure. quite a few things available. So uh, the uh, totally classic, your shoulders move when you move your arms. The shoulder is part of the arm. If you did not have an arm, you would not have to have a collarbone. <laughs> okay. So trace your fingers along your collarbone to the join on the middle, where it comes in the middle on your sternum, on your breastbone. Yeah. And there's something there, right? Yeah. And then feel with one hand. If you've got two hands, feel with one hand, one at that bump. And then move the arm around. That's right. Move your arm around. Can you feel a little bump moving in there? Uh, I don't think so. Should I? 
Is your collarbone moving? When you move your arm, is your collarbone moving? Oh, I can feel a little bit of movement. It's not very... It's just, yeah. There ought to be a whole pile of movement. Oh, yeah. you're there? Oh, dear. <laughs> All right. And in, and in the, uh, the shoulder blade. You know, people's shoulder blades, look at, look at, look at, look at, look at this. How much movement is that in my shoulder blade? Yeah, huge. Yeah, it's like, it's like, like this much movement, right? Yeah. The shoulders are organized to move a lot. I mean, the arm is move, moves at the shot, this joint moves even more. So I'm not saying it's the major movement here, but there's substantial movement here when a person uses their arms. And what we want to do is to define the word arm to include the collarbone and the, and the shoulder blade. This whole area. Yeah. That whole area. This is arm. When I move my hand and my arm moves, all of this will move. And you go to the anatomy textbooks, the biomechanics textbooks, and they'll say that not only will it move, but it must move. Right. And there are certain, you know, after about 10 degrees of movement of the arm away from the side, you'll have movement here. It's called scapulohumeral rhythm. That's the technical term for it. Okay. Whatever. You, you, you know, we don't have to be too technical. So yeah. this really being clear that when the hand goes forward, the shoulder will go forward because it follows the arm. It's part of the arm. Mm -hmm. If you've got in your mind some idea that your shoulders aren't supposed to move or even worse that they're supposed to be back and downwards, it can cause untold grief. For okay. people. It's a very basic piece of information. Your kids lift their hands up and their shoulders go up like that and you go, that's right, your whole arm moves, it's fine. Okay. There's a lot of music teachers will go, do not raise your shoulders. Uh, Just, yeah. But I, I, yeah, I mean, I have I have seen students do this kind of thing. I'm, I'm just lifting for people listening one of my shoulders up when right. they when they come to play something, which got, doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it seems like a little bit of a, a habit, which doesn't necessarily. So they haven't necessarily moved their arm up, but their shoulder does something weird. Yes. Yeah, so there's two things we'd say about that. The first thing is that it's always related to the balance of the of the core, mm. it's spine, head and spine. And when you lifted your shoulder up like that, because I'm watching you on the video, I can see what you're doing. <laughs> you actually pulled your head down that way, but you didn't know that you did that. Right, okay. <laughs> you, up, you pulled your head down. And if you have your student and, and you help them to balance, so they're not pulling their head down, then they're probably not going to pull their shoulder up so much. Okay. So that's one. Number two is the second thing we'd say is useful to know is the sequencing of actions. So timing, rhythm, sequencing, that's coordination, right? That how the parts move in relation to each other. The kind of piano activity, the the activity is occurring, people would say, at the keys on the fingers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's useful to talk about what's happening at the hammer on the string because the piano mechanism is psychically an extension of the body and the musculature and organization of the body is doing something where the music is created and the music is created where the vibration of the air starts and the vibration of the air starts on the string. Mm -hmm. right, so sometimes it's useful to get the all in here like this all handy and whatever, and you start getting to think about the hammers, and all of this starts to relax because their thinking has gone from here out there. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. They're thinking about the action, not thinking about the mechanics of the parts of the body. They're thinking about the action. The action is get the hammer, throw the hammer on the swing. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So with, this is a principle that we call a principle of the leading edge what is the leading edge of the action? For a typical hand movement, almost all hand movements, it's about doing something with the fingers. You're manipulating something with your hands and fingers, right? Mm -hmm. The leading edge of the action in that sense is the hand or the finger. You train people, there's a very, very simple technique we could, we could talk about a little bit. I don't know how well it'll come across on the podcast, but anyway. Right, we'll try it out. So, so, you know, if you take hold of somebody's arm and you move it around, piano teachers do that with their students all the time. Mm -hmm. Remind me to talk about the word relaxation in a minute. It's a little note. But anyway. Okay. I'll note it down. Yep. So the, sometimes you're, the student will resist the movement. And you're trying to move their arm and they hold it still. Mm. So that's the choice. They have the choice over the, whether that their arm move or not. Yes, I'm familiar with that. Yep. And they might make the choice of holding their arm still, right? which is a perfectly appropriate choice given that that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Talk to them about that. You say, okay, well, you could choose to hold your arm still. Practice that. You could choose to move it yourself. So when I move your arm like that, you could just go, oh, I'm going to move it like that. That's you moving your own arm. I've got my hand there, but you're moving yourself. So that's a choice that you could make. We could do that. That'd be fine. Mm -hmm. You could choose to do what people call relaxation, which is kind of let everything go all floppy and let me move your arm around. 
Mm -hmm. there's, there's absolutely no way in the world that you could possibly play the piano with a floppy arm like that, is there? No, agreed. It's no muscle tone, but nevertheless, so you could let, you could let it move all, kind of all floppy like that. And then there's a fourth one. You could, as the teacher, you could hold your hand up like this and get them to put their fingertips on your hand. And then you move your hand around and their job is to follow your hand. Right, okay. So you move your hand around and they've got to stay, they've got to keep their fingers on your fin on your hand and you keep moving your hand so they've got to stay with you. Okay. This creates a condition for freedom and looseness and ease and movement of the joints with self-direction of the, of the movement. So the person is actually taking their hand consciously, they're moving it, but they're not choosing the direction you are because you're doing this. So this okay. gives it something of the quality of what it can be like to be well coordinated in relation to the movement of the hands and the arms. Yeah, you follow yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So that when the hand comes to the keyboard, it's the fingers that are leading. And what tends to happen with your with your student, with your person, they go like, and they go, and they bring the hand like this, and you yeah. see this, this, they're leading with the shoulder. Oh, I see, yep. They're not with the hand. So there's an idea about sequencing. There's an idea that I look at my hand, I look at my fingers, I go, my fingers go into the keys, I take my hands to the keys. If there's freedom, relative balance in the body, person's relatively well balanced, then the shoulder girdle will respond by doing what it needs to do because that's what it's made for. But it's not the first thing that moves. The first thing that moves. So the, okay. so the person's trying to lift the weight of the arm by contracting in the musculature of the shoulders. It's one of the puzzles that we have teaching pianists because piano teachers often talk about arm weight. Yes. And relaxation. And while I, I'm... I'm getting better and better. I think I really do understand what that's about, and I'm getting better understanding about what, how I understand that. I've worked with a lot of piano teachers recently. Mm -hmm. It can be very problematic because if the person over relaxes the arm, it gets heavy. The heaviness is the reduction in the muscle tone that ought to be supporting the arm in relation to gravity. Mm -hmm. That means that then they have to contract other muscles to haul up against the heaviness. Okay. And it gets harder to play rather than easier. Even though the intention of the teacher, in, in you know, absolute genuine intention of the teacher was to create a condition of which is easier to play and create the sound that you want, sometimes that instruction can be counterproductive. It can get in the way. Okay. So that, that brings me to the question about relaxation because we'd say the sensation or the experience of relaxation, being relaxed when you play, is a consequence of being well coordinated. Right. It's a cause of being well coordinated. Relaxation is the consequence of good movement. It's not the cause of good movement. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah. The teacher says, well, well, just relax. Yeah. Relax, right? Yeah, I've said it before. I'm sure everyone listening is, yeah, like me. I've said that before. No, 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 no. I really want to say to him, I want to give, I want to give full credence to the, you know, I've worked with many piano teachers. They care about their students. They want the students to function really well. They care about their own playing. They want to function really well. And the way you do that is by getting good information and experimenting with it for yourself. Mm. You, you really do the best you can with the information that you've got. And I, you know, I really you know, give credence to that, respect that. Mm. There's nothing wrong with being the teacher that you are. The way that you are teaching is based on all the things that you know and you do the best you can, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you gain more information and you get better and better and that's even better, right? Mm. Mm. So, so, yeah. Anyway, relax. it's a funny thing because so often the instruction is given in the form of be relaxed when actually what the person was, wants is be coordinated, coordinated, but they don't know how to ask for that, yeah. so ask for the feeling instead. But to ask for coordination is essentially to ask for movement or action, okay. rather than to ask for a feeling. Okay, yep. Move your fingers to the keyboard, cooperate with the joints in your arms, is a different instruction from relax your arm as you put your hand on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. But I think you probably find that the first instruction is more effective in getting what you call relaxation. It's like an indirect, it's the method towards the thing that you want. And Alexander Technique is all about, is, is very much about that. It's about figuring out how do you create the conditions for the right thing to happen in the balance and the coordination and the playing rather than, I know this is what's supposed to happen, so I'm just going to try and do it. Yes. You yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's where we're at.
Well, wow. it, it's uh, yeah. There's a lot, isn't there? I, I, like we're scratching the very, very surface of it. And I understand that. And look, the whole point of the podcast is to just give people an awareness that this uh, Alexander technique is out there. Um, and look, I'm sure there are teachers, perhaps listening, who either have a student they know who have uh, pain, troubles, or injuries, or they themselves do. So, and if if they're interested in this, this make is making sense to them. What what can they do? Uh, they can get in touch with us. Uh, I'm accessible at alexandertechnique.com.au. So that's that's Sydney. Sydney Alexander Technique is my business. I'm based in Sydney. Okay. I do. We do run seminars and classes in other parts of Australia at times. So, and we have intensives that people can come and visit occasionally to do as well. So, so even for those who are outside of the Sydney region, there is some accessibility to what we're doing. And what about teachers internationally who might be listening? Are there? Do you do Skype uh, calls, or is it really something that has to be hands-on? Uh, I have experimented a bit with teaching by Skype because a few people have asked me, and it's been reasonably successful so far. So it, that is a possibility. Okay. Yeah. So there are Alexander teachers internationally, you know. So. Okay, so it is an international. Uh, you know, if you're living in New York or somewhere, you could be able to find someone. Yep. And I'm very happy. We're very happy to provide. The point is to that if people want to communicate with us, I can say, you know, here's a teacher in New York or here's a teacher in, you know, Seattle or the UK or Japan. I teach a lot in Japan, you know, those kinds of things. So, okay, great. It's happy, happy to pass on you know, referrals. Fantastic. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I'm starting a program next year specifically for professionals like music teachers who want to get enough or a taste of this information so that it can be helpful professionally without necessarily having to delve into the depth of Alexander teacher training. To become an Alexander teacher is a marvelous thing. It's a wonderful thing to do. Of course, I'm going to say that. <laughs> yes, I would expect it, yes. I would expect that. And I train teachers in Sydney. That's what I do. Okay. That's, uh, that's a, a number of years, is it? Or, it's, or? it's pretty much three years usually. Yeah, okay. Three years of training. We're doing a program called Body Minded, Body Minded Practitioner. Mm -hmm. And that's for music teachers and other people in related fields, so like a yoga teacher or a massage professional, people like that. We want to have very good anatomical and bio biomechanical information, which is presented in a practical context. So we meet once a month to do practical work with the information, and I'm presenting the, the, the anatomy and the biomechanics online and via email. So we're kind of doing a, a sort of a hybrid program where some of the information is presented, you can study at home, and then we do these little intensives where we actually work with it in a practical way. Okay, right. great. Right, the right balance, you know, for educating people about these things. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And there's information about that on your website, is there, or will be? It's not the website. It's a body-minded program. Anybody can email me, uh, greg at alexandertechnique.com.au. Great. Greg at alexandertechnique.com.au, and I will, you know, pass information on what we do to you. We'll make recommendations for teachers. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great joy working with musicians. I was a... I was a professional dancer originally. Mm -hmm. well, I trained in ballet and dance. I worked as a dancer for a while. Had these typical injuries and the, and the struggles, and that's what brought me into the Alexander work originally. Mm -hmm. And I still work with dancers, still, still train dancers, work with dancers. But increasingly, we've really focused the, the match between what we do and what happens in the music world is so close. And there are so many musicians who, who gain benefit from this kind of information. You know? So. It's been a great joy because I get little concerts all the time. You know, they come in, we go <laughs> like this, and then the double bass comes in and he plays with the double bass. And I have a lovely time. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. Enjoying music a whole lot that way. Out of interest, I've been meaning to ask: Is there are there some instruments that cause more problems than others? Yes, that's absolutely the case. What what are, what are those instruments? See the big grin on your face. <laughs> no, I'm interested to know. I'm thinking like, is it going to be something on like a tuba, or is it going to be a pipe organ, or what is it? <laughs> well, every instrument has its own its own challenges in terms of the mechanics, the biomechanics, and we could talk about different things for different instruments. Hmm. The the most challenging, I would say, in a general kind of a way, is is the oboe. Oh, the oh, oboe right. is very hard to play. Hmm. And there are a couple of specific sort of technical reasons for that, but primarily it's about the back pressure. Right. So to generate the power, in muscular terms, there's a distinction between what you might call force 
and what you might call power. Now, you're a cyclist, right? Mm. I love cyclists as well. I love cycling. Yep. And the distinction in, in cycling is, this, is cadence, the speed with which you turn the pedals. Mm. You can produce the same power output spinning the pedals fast as if you were pushing with more pressure, spinning the pedals more slowly. Slowly, agree, yeah. Which is why you see all the professional cyclists spinning the wheels, pedals really fast. Mm. You use less force on every stroke, but you do more strokes. Mm. And this is, the, this is the definition of the difference between force and power. For a musician, a pianist or, uh, you know, oboe player or breath, professional breath use, these kinds of things, the distinction is the distinction between the work that you do, the amount of force that you're using in the muscles, and the amount of movement that's occurring as a consequence of or as a part of the, of the use of that force. And people often mistake force for power. They're physics terms, so we don't get too technical. But yeah, sure. They mistake what we would typically call tension for what they actually want, and what they actually want is power. Okay. Power is the relation between the amount of effort, the amount of, of muscle work, and the movement that's occurring as you do it. If you produce a lot of effort and there's insufficient movement, then you get tension. Right. And that loads the joints and stiffens the mechanism and screws up the plane. Okay. And, and for oboe players, I have actually seen oboe players who have really seriously damaged their health by not really understanding that distinction and using so much force in the body that, you know, 10 or 20 years on, they're having health problems as a result of mm. so much pressure. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, so, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, every instrument has its own has its yeah. own challenges. I've uh, I've accompanied oboists before, and uh, yeah, it is. It doesn't even look easy. Like it's it, it's a hard, hard thing. Yeah, sound right. And I don't know what goes on in between your your nose and your mouth, and like to cause the pressure. Oh, yeah. Anyway, no, I'm glad I'm 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 a pianist. <laughs> well, look, Greg, thank you so much um, for your time today. It's been Really, really interesting. I've been fascinated by it, um, and I'd love. I think I'm going to have to come up to Sydney and have a have a proper session with you. Um, is there anything that uh, that you wanted to finish with, or something I haven't asked that is like vital, uh, you know, point that you needed to make? Or have we we've covered most things? We have. I mean, the, the general general statements is most people play music because they love it. If you're not loving it, then there's probably something in the way, and you can do something about that. Yes. So, you know, I was a dancer, and it was very, very hard work. But I started dancing because I love mov movement, I love moving. And it wasn't until after the ballet training that I started to figure out how to move with that enjoyment again. Mm. So, yeah. And everything that you do as a musician is professional movement. If you're a professional musician or you're a professional music teacher, you are a movement teacher. You cannot play the piano without moving, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. It's, you, can, you think of it that way. It's a, I'm teaching people how to coordinate themselves in relation to this wonderful instrument. And... When you think of it that way, it helps you to include the idea of the action of the person with the idea of the action of the instrument and the sound. And so it's kind of key to the whole thing, I think. Mm. Fantastic. Oh, I think we'll finish there. Great way to sum it up. Um, as usual, show notes uh, at timtopham.com forward slash episode 24. I'll pop down some links to Greg and his studio, uh, his email, and um, any of the other things that we've talked about that we can link to. We'll uh, pop on there. So, Greg, thanks again so much. I look forward to catching up with you again another time. Fantastic. Thank you.